do you think your life would be like if death just wasn't part of the equation? If you knew that you had unlimited time and resources, how would that change things? How would your life change if you just weren't afraid of death? Today, on The Voice of Prophecy, I'll introduce you to a man who had this all figured out. Even the knowledge that he was going to die soon didn't change his daily routine one little bit. Welcome to The Voice of Prophecy. I'm your host, Sean Boonstra, and today we're going to look at two different biblical passages that describe the final moments of a man's life. Now, one of them was written by an outside observer, and the other written by the man himself as he finds himself coming up against life's finish line. And I think you're going to find this really important because at some point, the same thing will happen to you. You're going to arrive at this moment you've always known was coming. Figuratively speaking, you will round third base and head for home plate. You will die. Unless, of course, you happen to be the one person in the last 2,000 years who doesn't. But you're not. So you might want to follow along. The man I'm talking about, the guy I'm going to examine, is the man who wrote most of the New Testament, a notable and unlikely convert to the Christian religion. His name? Saul of Tarsus. And, of course, that was later changed to Paul, and you know him as... The Apostle Paul, easily one of the most recognizable names in Christian history. What I'm going to do today is look at the closing chapters of his life from two different perspectives. One of those was written by Luke, who describes the very moment Paul gets the news that he's going to die soon. The other one was written by Paul himself as he describes his own attitude towards death in a moving letter addressed to his young apprentice. Now, both of these accounts come from the days, weeks, months leading up to the final moment when Paul is taken out of the city of Rome to a place now known as the Abbey of the Three Fountains, and they cut off his head. Just like some of these brave and virtually anonymous Christians who have been slaughtered in the Middle East right now by ISIS, they get beheaded. Paul was also beheaded for his faith. Now, personally, I have always suspected that the Romans probably wished they could crucify Paul if they could. I don't have historical data for it. I just suspect it because Paul had created a little civil unrest in a few places where he went, like the riot in Ephesus. And the Romans were always a little sensitive about people who had the potential to launch a groundswell movement against the empire, anything that might cause an uprising anybody who threatened the peace of the Roman Empire, the Pax Romana. Those kinds of people were often treated to a few days dying slowly on a cross. So I've always suspected they might have wanted to crucify Paul, but they couldn't because he was a Roman citizen. They had to cut off his head, and that happened just outside the city of Rome, in a place you can still visit today, the Abbey of the Three Fountains. Now, there's a church building there today, And it's been there for centuries. And inside, they've got this gruesome mural that shows Paul's head getting chopped off. And in the floor of the church, there are three holes. And above each hole is a picture of Paul's severed head. And they've designed it so it looks like Paul's head is still rolling downhill towards the front of the church. Now, those holes are there because there's this ancient legend that Paul's head, when they cut it off, bounced down the hillside, and it bounced three times, and every time it touched the ground, a spring of water miraculously came up from the dirt. And in the holes, you can still see the three springs, or the three fountains. Now, historically speaking, it probably is the place where Paul met his final end, where the great persecutor of Christians is ultimately martyred for his own Christian faith. Now, here's what I find fascinating about this whole story. It's the fact that Paul knew for sure that he was going to die. He knew that if he went to the city of Jerusalem, if he went there to preach, they would arrest him. And in spite of that, Paul still went. Nothing could stop him. And I guess it's his sheer determination to stick with his God-given mission that inspires me. I mean, he stuck with it no matter what. And Paul's martyrdom gives us one of the most eloquent, one of the most moving passages in the New Testament. The book of Acts records a prophet by the name of Agabus who shows up at a meeting where Paul is speaking and he warns Paul, nothing good will come of your trip to Jerusalem. And Paul still goes. 
I want to read that to you. Let me read it to you from this passage in the book of Acts because I think this is easily as magnificent as anything Shakespeare wrote about his fictitious characters. It's easily as inspiring as anything Plato wrote about the death of Socrates. You find it in Acts chapter 21, and I'll start reading in verse 10. Here's what the Bible says. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Now, Agabus's name actually means locust, which seems really appropriate for a guy who's coming to deliver some bad news. It says, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, I love the drama that a biblical prophet brings to a story. I mean, here's this guy who walks into the room, and he takes Paul's belt. Now, I don't know if the belt was laying at the side of the room with the coats or if somehow he had to talk Paul into giving it to him, but he takes Paul's belt and he ties up his own hands and he says, in front of all the believers, the man who owns this belt is going to be arrested and given to the Romans if he goes to Jerusalem. Now, if this had happened here in 21st century North America, I'd probably be tempted to take the prophecy with a grain of salt. Because over the years, I've met all sorts of wing nuts and cracker jacks who say they have a message from God. But what usually ends up happening with modern day prophets is that their so called message from God is usually used to justify some kind of unbiblical practice. So they might say something like, The Spirit told me to leave my wife, or The Spirit told me I don't have to live in harmony with God's moral law. It'll, it'll always be something like that. Most of the time in the modern age, you can write off the words of a man or woman who says, the Spirit told me this or that, because they're usually just making it up. But you still can't get around the fact that in the New Testament, there is this description of an authentic gift of prophecy that's still with us until Jesus returns. You'll find that gift in every single list of spiritual gifts. So if you believe the Bible, you have to concede that the real gift of prophecy is at least possible. And back in the first century, they didn't blink an eye. They knew this gift was real. They listened to Agabus because he was already well known, probably. He was probably known to be the real deal, someone with the authentic gift. And they assumed that the Holy Spirit was real and working through this man. Now, what I want you to listen to carefully is Paul's reaction to the prophetic message. But just before that, I have to take a quick break, and then I'll come right back, and I'll pick up where we left off in Acts chapter 21. So don't you go away. I'll be right back. Hello, I'm Jean Boonstra. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions? Like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? Are you searching for answers to these and other of life's most challenging questions? Well, the Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers that you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers in guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter the most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. And welcome back to The Voice of Prophecy. I'm your host, Sean Boonstra, and just before the break, we were looking at a dire prediction made by an ancient prophet to the Apostle Paul, just before Paul goes to Jerusalem. If you go, he says, they're going to arrest you and give you to the Romans. And we were partway into the story, as you find it in Acts chapter 21, so I want to pick up in verse 12 now, because it's really one of the most poetic passages anywhere in the Bible. Here it is, Acts 21, verse 12. Now, when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him, that's Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem, verse 13. 
Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a minute. Paul realizes he's going to die, or at least that it's a real possibility. But he is so laser-focused on his mission that even the threat of death doesn't slow him down. And I guess I find that powerful because it's not just the fact that Paul was willing to become a martyr for the faith, it's this idea that death doesn't change a thing about the way Paul lives. His business, his agenda, doesn't waver just because he discovers he's about to go around third base. He actually woke up the very next day and he lived his life the same way he would have if he didn't know he was going to die. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment because that's powerful. Most people, when they find out they're dying, they, they start to change everything. You quickly take care of all your unfinished business. You try to spend more time with your kids. You try to make peace with your adversaries. You, you change something. You change everything about your daily schedule just because you now know you're running out of time. But with Paul, nothing changes. Absolutely nothing. Tomorrow morning, he's going to get up and go to Jerusalem anyway. And I guess I read that and wish it's a skill that I had, the skill to live in such a way that nothing would ever have to change just because I find out I'm dying. You know, the other day I was driving across L.A. and I was listening to this radio preacher that I sometimes listen to when I get a chance. And, and he was talking to someone who made this fantastic point. This lady called in for advice because her doctor told her she was dying. She had only a few months to live. And she asked this guy, how do you think I should change my life now that I know I'm dying? Now, that's a logical question, right? I've only got a few months left. I got to know how do I use them? The guy on the radio said something I think will always stick with me. It was really compelling. He said, ma'am, you've always been dying. You've always known this day was coming. So why in the world would you now change the way you live? Why would you suddenly change everything? Why would anything be different just because you're a little closer to the moment of death? You've always known. And you know something? He had a really good point. We've always known we're going to die. You've known that since you were a kid. You've always been running out of time. So why would you live differently now than you would have just a few years ago? Every one of us has always been on borrowed time. Maybe we start to change our behavior because we really struggle to identify death, to recognize it for what it is when we're really young. We, we can't really grasp what it means to be mortal, what it means to bump up against the finish line. It's just too far away when you're 15 or 20 years old. You don't have to deal with it. But when you get closer, it's much bigger. It kind of reminds me of this story I read a little while ago about an African bushman who lived his whole life in the forest, where everything was up close all the time. He had never seen anything way off in the distance. Then somebody took him out on the plains where he could see for miles in every direction, and he struggled to comprehend what he was seeing. Then suddenly, off in the distance, he sees this tiny little speck moving across the horizon, and he says to his friend, What's that little thing? Well, that's a buffalo. And the bushman didn't believe it. He said, That's not a buffalo. It's way too small. A buffalo is huge. It's this big. And that thing is tiny, like a little tiny fly. He couldn't see it for what it was because it was off in the distance. He couldn't comprehend how big it was. And maybe that's the way it is with death. Maybe when you're young, it's a buffalo off in the distance and you really don't get it. You can't really see it. But then it comes closer. You get close to the end of your life and now it's a humongous beast that you have to deal with. Maybe that's what it is. Or maybe it's just a matter of scarcity. I mean, when you're young, it seems like you have forever. And so you don't really value your time. Then when you're running out of it, when you have months or weeks or days to live, then you really understand what time is worth. Maybe that's why we panic at the finish line and we finally start to live. You finally start to do those things you've always wanted to do. But look at the life of Paul. He doesn't change. He refuses to change his agenda just because it's time to punch the clock. His life tomorrow is going to be exactly the same as it was yesterday. Because Paul has always been consistent. His life has always been about purpose and mission and meaning. Paul has always lived God's agenda instead of his own. 
This story is one of the reasons I like to believe that Paul actually is the author of the book of Hebrews. Now, I know scholars debate whether or not Paul wrote that book, but I've always wanted to believe it's him, partly because of some of the internal evidence in the book, but partly because much of what you find in Hebrews just matches the character and ministry of Paul. And there's this passage in Hebrews in the second chapter that absolutely applies to the story of his death. It kind of explains how Christians can go on living exactly the way they did before they knew they were dying. It's because Christianity, I mean, honest to goodness, biblical Christianity isn't afraid of death. I mean, listen to this. It's Hebrews 2 verse 14. Here's what it says. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, if you understand the cross, if you grasp what Jesus accomplished by becoming a member of the human race and dying for us, all of a sudden death begins to lose its sting. You're not afraid of it. The fear of death is just off the table. Now, that doesn't mean you want to die. Nobody does. It doesn't mean you'll enjoy it. And it doesn't mean that there won't be a little anxiety when the moment actually comes. But that gut-wrenching, basic, primal fear of death, this fear of permanent extinction, it doesn't apply to the Christian. The fear of death is off the table, and it makes you free to live every moment of your life. Now, I'm going to take another quick break, and then I'm going to come right back, and I want to look at something that Paul wrote about his own death. I'll be right back. Hello, I'm Jean Boonstra. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions? Answers to help you make sense of the chaos you see all around you in today's world. Answers to the deepest questions in life, like, where is God when we suffer? The stories of pain and suffering in this world surround us at every turn. There's a world of hurt. And maybe you're wondering, does God see it all? In this world of pain, is there really a chance for true happiness in this life? Is there a secret to living a happy, contented life amidst the chaos? Well, if you're searching for answers to these and other of life's most challenging questions, we are here to help. The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers that you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at our toll-free number, 888-456-7933, for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There's never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. You'll find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and From Guilty Sinner to Forgiven Saint. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides as the major themes of the Bible come to life. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. And we are back from the break, and I hope you were paying attention during the break, because the Discover Bible course really does have the potential to give you the kind of unwavering purpose and security that the Apostle Paul had. Now, today we've been talking about the way Paul discovers that his own life is about to come to an end. And yet that news doesn't seem to affect his life's agenda one little bit. He doesn't change course just because God shows him that if he actually goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested. And the likelihood of surviving that arrest in the Roman Empire? Not very good. Yet Paul is so secure in the purpose of his life. He is so in tune with what happened at the cross with Jesus that the fear of death is simply off the table. I mean, just listen to what Paul says back in Acts chapter 21. He says, For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, honestly, that's a skill I wish I had. I mean, that's the way I want to live my life. I want to live so that when the moment actually comes, it doesn't make a bit of difference. I will do the same things that day that I did the rest of my life. I can be consistent and fearless because death is not a factor. Now, if I'm honest, that's not a skill I'm sure I've mastered yet. 
even though I have had a few close shaves with death in my own life. It's not a skill that I'm sure I have, but I'm asking God to give it to me. I want what Paul had. I mean, think about this. This would be incredible to not blink an eye when they say, hey, you're going to die soon. Now, Acts chapter 21 was Luke's account of what happened to Paul. But if you go further into the New Testament, there's this other passage where Paul writes a final message to a young preacher by the name of Timothy. And he gives some final advice before he actually goes to his execution. You find this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'll start reading in verse 1. He's speaking to Timothy. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. You can sense in this passage what Paul is thinking about. This is finish line theology. Paul knows he's going to die, so he's thinking about stuff like the final judgment. He's about to be unjustly condemned, unjustly executed, but he leaves it up to God to sort out how those horrible injustices will be straightened out. He knows Jesus will judge the living and the dead. Now we'll continue in verse 2, and I want you to listen to his last advice for his young friend. Preach the word, he says. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Listen to what he's saying. He's telling Timothy to live consistently. Don't you let circumstances change your mission. You stay the course. You preach the truth. You keep with God's agenda no matter what the circumstances. That's being written by a guy who's about to be decapitated. He continues in verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Again, I hope you're really listening to this. He's saying, Timothy, don't let anything stop you from living the life that God has given you. Even death doesn't change the game. You've always been dying, so live like you've lived every day of your life. Now, now here comes the stunning part. I want you to listen to this. It's in verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I mean, listen to that. Go back and read it later. It's an absolutely breathtaking passage. It makes me want to be like Paul. That's the kind of man I want to be. Now, I'm going to jump down to verse 13 so we don't run out of time because there's something really important there. I mean, just listen to what he asks of Timothy. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Now, ask yourself, why in the world would Paul want his books? I mean, he's going to die in a matter of days or weeks or maybe months at the outside, and he wants his books. I mean, Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that some of our atheist friends are right, that the moment you die, that's it. Lights out forever, and you never come back. There will never be a resurrection or a second coming. Let's just, for the sake of argument, suppose they're right. Then what would be the point of studying when you know you're going to die? If you know that you're not preparing for something in the future, if you know you're not getting ready for a job interview, if you're not studying for an exam, then why would you want your books? Why would you bother studying? What would be the point? It's a little bit like booking a piano lesson for the day after you know they're going to amputate your fingers. It doesn't make sense. When you die, your brain's going to shut off. You're going to slip into darkness forever. What's the point of studying? Unless you know that it's not the end. Unless the fear of death is now off the table. And you understand that the character you build in this life right now is going to carry forward for all eternity then studying does make sense. Even though Paul knows he's going to die, he still wants to study. His agenda, his lifestyle, his habits, they don't change. Not even a little bit. Not one iota. Now, when I read that, I'm kind of blown away. 
that's the kind of man I want to be. I want to live every minute of my life knowing that it doesn't make a difference when I find out I'm going to die, that I've been living God's purpose for my life the whole time, that even in the last few moments I'm still calling for my books because I want to study, because I know that there's a future, that I know Jesus is coming again. I know that I'm still preparing for all eternity. The fear of death is off the table. And you know, if there's one thing that I wish for you, I mean, apart from the fact that I really want you to have a deep, meaningful, saving relationship with Christ, apart from that, if there's one thing I wish, it's that you would develop the ability to live the kind of life where it wouldn't matter how much time you have. Where if the doctor said, look, you've only got days left, weeks left, months left, if the doctor told you you were going to die, you'd live exactly the same way the next day that you did the day before. It's my prayer that you would always know exactly what your life means, that you would find deep purpose for your existence, that you would know who you are and where you're headed every waking minute of every day. I'm praying that your purpose would be so secure, that your future would be so guaranteed that you'd still feel like studying on the last day of your life. In the meantime, I'm going to encourage you, go get your book right now, the one book, the book of God. Go and get it and spend a little time getting to know the God who can actually take the fear of death completely off the table. And remember, if you'd like a little bit of help studying your Bible, if you want to study all the major themes in a systematic way, then ask us for the Discover Bible course. We've had more than a million people complete the course at this point, and they're all telling me that this has brought them closer to God. This has helped them understand that they have a secure future with Jesus. And I'd encourage you to ask us for it. It's yours free just for the asking. Thanks for listening for another week. This has been the Voice of Prophecy. I'm your host, Sean Boonstra, and we will see you again next time. Hello, I'm Jean Boonstra. As unpleasant as the thought is, Sean is right. We all have to face the reality of death one day. One day we'll draw a breath and that will be our last. We may not know when or where, but the Bible gives us plenty of prep material. The story of Paul's life and death is a great example. Paul was a man dramatically changed by God and used of him in his life and death. Maybe Paul's story has you asking about life and death and what it all means. If you're searching for answers, I know where you can begin to find them. The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers that you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at our toll-free number, 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. The 26 Discover Guides cover a whole range of subjects, including the ones we're talking about today. Guide number 13 is called From Guilty Sinner to Forgiven Saint and walks the reader through a life-changing experience. And Guide 24 answers one of life's toughest questions. When a person dies, what then? Study online at our website, BibleStudies.com, or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Now, while you're online, be sure to visit us at VOP.com. At VOP.com, you'll find audio archives of this program, the latest ministry news, and resources to help you dig deeply into God's Word. And did you know that you can listen to this program for your smartphone or tablet? Just search for Voice of Prophecy in your favorite app store. So give us a call at 888-456-7933 or visit us online to begin your journey to discover answers to life's deepest questions. Visit us today at BibleStudies.com. Thank you.